Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Write or Die show. I'm your host, Randy Lee Bosla. On the show, we interview other writers and we talk about mental health from their personal journeys. If you have not already hit that like and subscribe button, go ahead, do that now so that you never miss an episode. Hello. So today we have Gail Smith with us. How are you? I'm good today. Yep. Excellent. And where are you joining us from? I'm joining you from uh, my horse farm southeast of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Okay. Hold on. A couple things here. First off, you have horses? How many horses? <laughs> I do have lots of horses. <gasps> yeah. I, I, yeah. I love horses too. I'm glad you love horses as well. I love yeah. horses. So when I was little, my uncle had a horse farm. So I learned to ride horses. Haven't done it in oodles of years. And then when I got married 10 years ago, um, I convinced my husband. So we got married in Vegas and I convinced my husband for our honeymoon that we should go um, to this ranch for they did like this cool ranch dinner, like um, right over the, the campfire and then a horse ride around the, the ranch or whatever. And so he agreed to do it. He will never go back on a horse again. <laughs> He said it tried to kill him, which it still didn't. Um, he was just scared. But it was so much fun. And I'm like, oh, I want to go back on a horse again. Anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing, you're Canadian too. I'm in Ontario. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So how chilly is it there? Because you're usually more chilly than me. Yeah, we're usually more chill. It's minus 12 right right now, Celsius. Do you have snow so right now? Bad. Pardon? Do you have snow right now? Oh yeah, lots of snow, lots of snow. We've been cross country skiing. We set trails outside our farm uh, in our yard. Well, I guess if you have that much space to like do all that, that would be fun. But I don't tend, yeah, I don't tend to cold. I don't, I don't do anything in the winter. So yeah, no, we are. My car said it was only negative two right now, which isn't too bad. Um, but no snow right now at all. So it's awesome. <laughs> we have had oh, very little snow so far yeah um yeah we get tired of the snow well not so much the snow but really cold weather we get tired of but it's fun to be outside and play in the snow so we have to embrace it since we live up here but we are going to have a hot holiday next week so oh where are we you going have have those. well to mexico <laughs> Hopefully. Oh, that's awesome the week after we're going to cuba Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Oh, so, I know. So my mom's going to come stay here with all my animals, babysit my house. That'd be great. I can't wait. Yeah, um, good. Okay. So, I mean, we, we've sort of already gotten into this question, but <laughs> tell me, other than horse farms and snowshoeing and all that fun stuff, tell me about who Gail is. Yeah. Um. Well, probably one thing I... um. You might not know about me is that I was actually a, um, a marriage and I was a mental health practitioner in my professional life. Oh. So I was a, I had a private practice at one time and also was a school counselor. So um, when you're um, offered to share a journey with mental health um, was was put out there, then I, I felt like I could you definitely to. speak. To that. Yeah, couldn't pass yeah. it by. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, Okay, so that's a little bit more about you. So let's jump right into our main discussion then about mental health. And right. uh, you start the conversation wherever makes the most sense um, for you. Right. I suppose my first memory of struggling with mental health was when um, I was a young child and also continuing on into my teens. And I had terrible nightmares. I... I I, at least from my experience, I, I had very bad dreams. They'd wake me up at night and I couldn't fall back asleep. I, I remember laying terrified in my bed. Okay. In those days, um, you know, we didn't crawl in bed with our parents or at least <laughs> I did. Um, oh. I mean, that's what my children and grandchildren would do now, but that option didn't feel like one for me to get that that kind of comfort in the middle of the night for whatever reason it was. I'm, I'm, I don't ever remember my parents saying that I couldn't do that, but I just didn't choose that for myself. Okay. I, I, I suffered alone and um, up 
and I still remember my nightmares. I mean, um, so I have a lot of empathy for people who have really bad dreams. It can be very disturbing. Um, so when I um, became a young young teenager, and I, I would say I would be 16, 17 years old, I, again, I think your awareness of the world increases and uh, you yeah. become more aware of traumas that are out there, bad things that can happen to people. Yeah, uh, I became I became more aware of evil, basically that the the presence okay. of evil in life, and I think again that contributed to nightmares that that maybe went away from monsters over to to really dark evil kind of kind of subjects, and so again, so like people evil stuff. Well, yeah, I think you said away from monsters. So I'm just kind of trying to put a yeah, I think I just really evil energy. Um, okay. Um, and maybe, and maybe I remember the feelings a little more than the specifics. But I remember, you know, I guess the feeling that a being or, or a person or a, a, an entity maybe wasn't what you thought it was. And so this oh, okay. other side came out and um yeah, not to be trusted. Okay, I suppose that part so of it. So, when you talk about the emotions, it's just interesting that you're say, you know, I remember the emotions more than the actual thoughts, right? And mm-hmm. right now, with my therapist, she is working on helping me to actually put names to my feelings and emotions because yes, I've never liked doing that. But right now, we're also talking about you know, how did I feel back when X, Y, Z happened? And I can describe the feeling much more than the event. Mm -hmm. The feelings stick with us. And I think that's part of why mental health is so tricky um, at times, because it's hard to articulate the event happening or that did happen if it's a past event that triggered all these feelings of, well, for me, all these feelings of worthlessness and the depression and all those things, it's hard to put words to it when it's a feeling, not an event. So Mm -hmm. I just thought that was interesting because we were literally, that's what we're doing right now with my therapist. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, it's good to unpack all that in therapy for sure. And, and to try and, um, you know, probably try and discover some of those triggering events and those kind of things. So you can understand the connection to your feelings. I yeah. I don't, you know, but for me at that time, I didn't have a therapist. I mean, this is in the 1980s. And um, I, I didn't really know much about counseling or didn't have access to that, or even to talk to my parents about that or anybody else. So it was very much an internal journey for me to try and figure out a way so I could sleep at night and not be wake woken up with really, really uh, upsetting feelings. So I found a way um, to kind of, I don't know how I came up with this. I really don't. There must have been something that inspired me. I was a big reader as a child and certainly escaped into stories and reading. I read everything I could, all the children's stories that were available to me, I'd empty out the library at our school and, and read everything that That's was awesome. remotely interesting. So I think probably now that I'm just thinking aloud, I'm thinking that reading gives people an opportunity to use their imagination and create a story or be in a story, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. And so I think for me then that I had this idea, I still remember it quite distinctly, just saying, I have to do something different. And so I, before I went to sleep, I'd reimagine, let's say there was a conflict in the dream. And I'd reimagine that I found a way to overcome my adversary. And, um, and so I actually remember thinking this through and falling asleep. And sure enough, my dreams changed. I, I was just so relieved at that and um yes it was that was my very first memory I think of actually feeling like I could have some control 
or restory my life in a way so that my emotions were, you know, my, my emotional life, my imaginative life, my dream life, whatever I'm, was, was, was felt safer for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it probably affected my relationships with people too. You know, I, I'm not, I, we could psychoanalyze them all and, and <laughs> we could <laughs> figure we could. out what all this was about, probably about lack of control, you know, stuff like that. But, yep. but it didn't really matter to me. I just, I just didn't want to have bad dreams anymore. Yeah. So, and ultimately it doesn't matter. Like you said, it, it didn't matter to you, but really in the grand scheme, it didn't matter necessarily why it was happening, but how do you fix what was happening? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which some people might be like, oh, but you can't fix it if you don't know the why. Da, 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 da. But for the purpose of what you needed at the time, it, it wasn't, the why wasn't important. Yeah. And, and I think our whys, you know, um, might, why I might be feeling a certain way might actually keep me stuck. If yeah. I have that belief system about myself, about why I'm a certain way, why I'm shy, why I'm scared, whatever, you know, it may be why I'm angry. So if you have a belief system um, that sort of explains that it, it, it for you, sometimes, I, I mean, therapy is a very complex topic, so I don't want to overgeneralize anything. Oh, of course. Or, but, but I think, um, sometimes um that keeps us stuck and so um there is there is a kind of therapy called narrative therapy where you um look at the story of your life and the meaning you've given to it and then part of the part of the recovery is or healing or or self-awareness the growth in self-awareness is to kind of look at that story and and find the exceptions in it and then make a new story for yourself and um I, I don't know. I think as writers, you know, that whole idea about um, being the narrator of your life or the narrator of your story and then yes. writing the kind of story you want to you want to tell and that you want to live. I think that's really empowering. I totally agree. And so, again, you're talking about stuff that that I was just working on last week in therapy with being stuck. So we were talking about stuck points. Like specifically okay. that's what she was calling them and uh yeah the, it's the thought that I'm telling myself over and over and it's just stuck and it's playing on repeat and it's that narrative and changing the narrative and how do you go about doing that and it is complicated that's why I go to therapy that's why I go to you know a person who is trained in doing it um yeah. because I can't do it on my own tried that didn't work <laughs> Oh, it's good. And I think when you go talk to someone who's skilled in listening and uh, helping you unpack your story, um, you um, there's healing in that, in, uh, in telling your story. So, you know, yeah, you're right. Sometimes it's being in the presence of a caring person who's, who's got some empathy and skills really is a, is a very healing thing in itself. And yeah. so... Yeah, good for you. Yeah. Thank you. So, okay. So then you said, um, I'm probably skipping a few years here, but oh, that's fine. <laughs> you said that you were a school counselor for a long time. You were in the mental health field. How did you go from nightmares <laughs> to wanting to work in that field? Yeah, I I suppose it had something to do with being sensitive and empathetic and wanting to help people. So um yeah, I always saw myself in that area. And of course, since I was that sensitive, I wasn't going to be a nurse because the sight of needles or blood or anything oh, like that. Mm -hmm. no. no, yeah. thank you. Although I have great respect. My sister's a nurse. I have great respect for people who are able to do that. And and I actually do engage in nursing activities with my horses. But but so I kind of gotten over that. But But I mean, when you're a young person and you look at what your options are, um, at that time in, in life and, and, um, uh, you know, being a young female, I felt the caring profession was one that I went into and I, I did go into education and then I went in, into, um, uh, the, and studied in the ministry. And then I took some extra training and counseling, and then I got a, um, training and certification in the American Association of Marriage and Pastoral, uh, Marriage and Family Therapists. And wow. so, uh, yeah, 
So it's a lot of training, a lot of supervision, a lot of working with couples and families over the years. I spent thousands of hours in, you know, being a therapist and, and, and consulting with master, master therapists and therapists in order to get my training and certification. So it was a very satisfying career. So how do you, being in that field, so I was in social services for a few years. Mm-hmm. I was an employment counselor. So oh, cool. uh, yeah. th- this is an interesting topic to me. When you are in social services or the mental health field or any kind of caring field, really, what do you do for yourself so you don't bring all of that home? Oh, yeah. the Good, good, good comment. Yeah. Um, that is very good. And you know what helped me was coming home to my farm and my horses, quite on and my family, of course. But if I um, and it took some, again, some self-awareness and some skills to build that kind of um, those professional boundaries, right, where you can say works at work and homes at home. Yeah. But for sure, for sure, there's times when it's extra stressful, it crosses over. Um, uh, you know, we're only human and things happen. Um, but, you know, and as I worked with children in the school system, I mean, that was really hard because children are very vulnerable young people, you know, and I had to kind of emotionally deal with that change from working mostly with adults who, you know, for the most part can make their own choices, um, live with their, you know, their adults, right? Whereas when you, oh, you've got a kitty uh, or when, so so then when you work with kids, they're much more vulnerable. And I, I remember being quite taken with that. So, I mean, I was at home raising my own family. And uh, I think what happened is I come home, I have my beautiful environment, I have my horses, you know, I have cats and dogs, and it just um, moves you into a different space, you can't help it, right. And so mentally, I got a break. I mean, if I ended up not sleeping very good, and having worrisome thoughts, maybe recur again you know bad dreams I wouldn't say there were nightmares like I had when I I was a child I would say to myself hmm I think my work is kind of stressful for me right now and I need to you know maybe make a a change there slightly or sometimes it was just acknowledging that my work was stressful and and that it was affecting me that I could kind of take a breath and let it go and yeah just carry on Let's talk about acknowledgement. So you yeah. said you said a ton of really really good things oh, cool. there, okay. um, but that word stuck out at me. But before I get into that, this is my co-host Black Cat. Okay. Um, funny story of how she got her name. I don't think I've shared it on the show yet. Um, it's a little off topic, but it's hilarious. So we're gonna do it. Um, yeah. So we got Black Cat quite a few years ago now, maybe five six years ago, and we got her as, as a kitten, and. Within an hour of getting her, she bolts out the door. And we're like, oh, no. And it was thunderstorming out. And my kid, actually, maybe we've had you longer than that. Maybe, like, close to eight years. Um, Because my kid was much younger. He he was 16 now. So probably, yeah, he would have been eight or nine. Anyways, and he's crying. Uh, We hadn't named the cat yet. That's an important part of the story. I want my black cat back. I want my black cat. And so for the whole, for hours, we're yelling, black cat, come here, come here, you black cat. And we got to find the black cat. And so black cat just became her name because we had all been Uh. yelling at trying to find her. And she was just in the neighbor's shed. Um, Nobody was living in that house yet. And uh, so she was hiding there, petrified. My husband got her. And now she's just a big snuggly, snuggly thing. Uh. Scared of absolutely everything. But uh yeah, I had to share that funny story of how Black Cat got her name of being Black Cat. That, that, so, uh, moral uh, of that story, if you don't not want your cat to just end up with a random name um, because you just start saying it, come up with the name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, animals are so great. I have lots of them. And yeah, coming home to them makes a really big difference. Having dogs that force you to go outside or for you horses, they force you to go outside. Because there's also something about being outside that's very helpful. Oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 Um, But we've talked a lot about that on other episodes with people, but acknowledgement is something that hasn't come up a heck of a lot. So that's why I wanted to pick on that word specifically. So acknowledging that it is stressful 
is what you said. So the, it's <laughs> acknowledging that something is wrong. And that's what they say is the first step to recovery, right? Um, for when you have an addiction, but it's also the first step in anything. Acknowledging that you need help. Acknowledging that I couldn't do what I'm doing in therapy by myself. Acknowledging that um, I need to go outside and, and play with the horses. Acknowledging that something is happening right now and I shouldn't be by myself, right? So that word acknowledgement, that's a big word. It's a lot mm -hmm. there. Yeah, it's very important. And one of one of the the tasks of therapy, I hope I can remember to say this right, but it's to take that which is that you're unaware of and to create awareness about it. And so um, sometimes we have things that, you know, yeah, we we don't realize about ourselves or or whatever our pain or or uh, discomfort is about is about something that we haven't named and and I think that is yeah now that you're pointing that out I, I think and I'm reflecting on my training from many years ago and my work that um, yeah that that bringing to light that which has been hidden and acknowledging it is is very much part of the healing process yes you're very distracting kitty it's just like a cat, isn't it? They just want to get right in there. Well, and I had shut the door. So when I saw her pop in, I was like, what's going on? Apparently, I didn't like click it closed. Oh, she knows how to open doors. Yeah. Tricky, tricky girl. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, acknowledgement is that first step. And I think if we skip that step, and I definitely have tried to skip that step my on my own. So it is possible but it's not healthy to skip it because if you skip that step I go from you know feeling depressed um to just wanting to be happy and feel better but if I don't acknowledge that there's a problem I can't get to it I'm, I'm missing something the bridge is broken and I can't jump over it and then I end up falling down deeper yeah yeah um, that's a nice visual, actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. That bridge is a very powerful image. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So that acknowledgement yeah. builds the bridge so that you can get to the place that you want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, we're all at different points in our journey where we're ready to acknowledge things or not, right? Exactly. Because, I mean, denial, right, is the is kind of also what we're talking about is, is a coping mechanism and yeah. so um you know we can deny things are happening and and i admit to being a denier about certain things oh just yeah because, me too <laughs> you know hands gonna, up in the chat who denies <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever and because you need just need to cope for for yes. that time and i mean again i think it's or maybe it's not so much denial as saying you know what i realize this is an issue I, i'm going to set it aside I mean, especially if we have to go through medical procedures or have a test come up and, you know, we can get overly concerned with the results of the test. But at the same time, we could say, you know what, I'm going to deal with that later. I'm just not going to give that center stage in my life right now. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll deal with, you know, so that that kind of practice of knowing when to acknowledge things and uh, and work on them, build those bridges and when to say, you know, this isn't going to overcome overtake my life right now either right so mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of balancing those things I think I mean so yeah. oh I totally agree with you yeah <laughs> so where are you at in life now because it's you know you've gone through a lot you went through these nightmares and then having to deal with other people's issues and keeping that distance with yourself so where are you at in life now right right now I have um yeah I am a grandmother of seven grandchildren. That man. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, you know, I I'm denying aging, actually. <laughs> oh no. Oh, you don't age, you level up and occasionally evolve. That's what happens. See? That's yeah. right. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm leveling up and um just uh I I'm retired retired from my off the farm job. And so we raised and um, and board and you know do some training of horses and competing with them and I do some instruction 
uh, coaching with riders and um, still do a little competition myself. So oh, nice. Uh, yeah. So, you know, where I'm at in my life is enjoying my freedoms and independence and and uh, my husband and I have a lot of fun for the most part. We we don't dwell on our um, we try not to anyways <laughs> dwell on, um, you know, the whole thing about aging and feeling older, which which, um, yeah, sometimes isn't so pleasant. But yeah, but hold but on. For so, the most, I'm going to take yeah. a side note on that only because sure. um, aging is can be a heavy topic for for some people I know my grandfather he is not too happy right now with his aging he's in his 80s and Mm -hmm. the doctor recently diagnosed him with early um early onset dementia like the early stages and he's he's of course in denial no 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 but my grandmother only ever made it to 69 when she passed away right so yes aging comes with some struggles but aging means that you're still here aging means that you have successfully beaten a bunch of boss levels <laughs> um, and you are leveling up every year and so you know yeah it comes with some some problems sometimes but enjoy it and be happy that you are still here to be able to age yeah you're right well spoken i appreciate it <laughs> yeah so anyway we we don't act our age my a little what is that uh, anyways <laughs> i know so that's true so um yeah anyway we are we are um probably um have roles as role models in our community of people and we play hard and work hard and um are always op- open to adventures and yeah, we're in a situation where we can do that. So we're lucky. That is fantastic. Um, yeah. And so in this lovely retirement age, is that when you decided to start writing or were you writing before that? Well, writing? Yeah. Um, I, yeah. You know what? Writing and books have always been a big part of my life. And as a teeny little... I remember you talking about that. Girl, yeah. I actually still have these little books I made with... Uh, cowboy small and black beauty and I still have these I should preserve them in uh, photos some way and and maybe have a story about that but yeah I I love writing and drawing and creating stories from a very young age but when I really thought at one point in my life um, that I wanted to write it was a long time ago Um, and I just started um, taking classes and I went to the university outreach program where they had a writer uh, teaching creative writing and it was my first experience with you know uh, besides high school or whatever taking creative writing and so I just ate it up and then some of us joined started a writer's group and then yeah and so then I um, took more courses Uh, I ended up the University of Saskatchewan has is a wonderful resource. And I ended up taking a course with Guy Vanderhaeg on short story writing. And that was pretty cool. Um, he's a really well-known Canadian writer. And then um, I um, kept moving along. I was in another writing group at this point and had also been consulting with writers in residence. So um, in our city, we the, the, the public library system hires a writer in residence every year. And I've been to many of them and uh, you can go for free and they you send them your your manuscript or your piece of writing 10 pages or whatever they agree on with you and and um you can go in and get their feedback and so I just I think over all those years I was developing what we would call the craft of writing and I was developing a portfolio of writing I'd written one novel a young person's novel which is still in the trunk, so to speak. But then I started another one and I was then, then I applied to the newly formed um, University of Saskatchewan Writers and Res, uh, MFA in Writing, uh, Masters in Fine Arts in Writing. And I was the third, and part of the third cohort to, to go through the program. And so I just thought I would 
was in an incredibly privileged, lucky position to be with all these creative people reading each other's works and, you know, just studying poetry and short story and, and our long manuscripts. And so that's where I developed my, my uh, manuscript, which, um, yeah, eventually got published here just this last fall. And what is so, it called? Uh, yeah. So it's, it's a historical novel called Thickwood and um, yeah, it's based in post-world war two in Saskatchewan. And uh, yeah, it's was fun to write and fun to research. Okay, so, so tell us a little bit more about it so that people want to go and buy it. <laughs> okay, well, because I love horses too, the, there's definitely a horse element in it. It's, uh, yeah, because I, I wanted to write the kind of book I wanted to read, right? So Yeah, exactly. I, <laughs> so I found this young woman character. She was amused for many years. I wrote around and about her in many ways over the years. And I finally found her home in this novel. And so um, she's a horse loving, roping uh, young woman in in a remote kind of setting in Saskatchewan, kind of where the prairie meets the forest in this transition zone in the in Saskatchewan. And um, she also has is a baseball player, which many people were you know, in the early part of the century in Saskatchewan, lots of people played baseball, but she got recruited to play in the All-American Girls Baseball League. And so she goes off to Illinois to play with Rockford Peaches, makes her fortune <laughs> and fame, and then comes back to the ranch with some thoroughbred mares that she wants to breed to be, and then her adventures start from there. But uh, yeah, very nice. And where do people pick this up? Uh, you can find it on your favorite uh, outlet. It's available in um, audio and in digital form and print form. So it's on Amazon and um, other other outlets there. And uh, it's in our local bookstores here. And and my publisher, who um, was a writer in residence at at one time. Um, and who had approached me if he could publish my book is Ed Willett. And um, he has a new press called Shadow Paw Press. And he also has a black cat with a personality like yours. So oh, nice. They're <laughs> yeah, so it's sweet. Pretty, yeah, it was pretty cool that um, your black cat showed up today because uh, Shadow Paw Press is named after Shadow Paw, the, the black cat. So I love it. Yeah, so you can you can buy the book from Shadow Pro Press as well. So yeah, that's that's my story. That and, is awesome. And so where yeah. do people follow you? Okay, yeah, I have well, Facebook. I'm on Facebook, Gail M. Smith. I have uh, a blog that I've I, I've tended to write my horse adventures on there because what I did is I you know I've created because I do a lot of horse adventures. I I do pack trips in the wilderness with my husband and I compete and go to the mountains. And uh, I play a sport called polo cross, which is like polo and lacrosse on horseback. And I get all suited up and it's like, I'm going to battle on my horse and we're getting the ball and we're going to score and beat her. That opponent. sounds so oh, fun. It's a, it's a blast. I used to do all kinds of other horse sports, but now at this point in my life, I enjoy it because I play with my family, my son-in-law and daughter also play, my grandson plays. So for me, and my husband does too. So for me, it's very satisfying to share that with my family. So that's why I participate in that sport, besides it being a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But I have all these adventures. And so people have always, are, well, lots of people tell me they like to follow my horse adventures on my you know blog or my Facebook page. And then we also have uh, a Sunny Plain Ranch Facebook page where we run um, our, you know, things about our horse boarding facility and, um, uh, share knowledge about horses. So, and I'm on, uh, I have an Instagram account and I wrote some poetry. Um, so short, short poetry and took some photos and I posted them on Instagram. I called it love poems to Equus. Oh, very nice. Yeah. And we're going to stick all those links down in the description below. Oh. Okay, sounds nice. <laughs>
So Thank everyone you. can easily find you. Any last words to share? Hmm. Well, I just think your uh, uh, series Write or Die is a very interesting concept. And uh, mm. I think, yeah, no, I, I liked it. And so I just thought that um, this whole idea of being writers and then combining that with mental health. And I think part of writing is that you can write out your feelings and, you know, it can cathart that way and, and get the problems outside of yourself and through writing. Um, and, but you can, but we're storytellers, right? And so, yeah. yeah. And so I think to be a storyteller is a pretty cool thing. And that when you can encounter problems in your life or whatever, you can restory them. You can be a narrator for yourself and, and, choose to write a different story doesn't mean that it's smooth sailing just like in any book we've got to have you know <laughs> problems to overcome but in the end we hope for a good resolution right and so um something satisfying and I think that's what we're looking for in our lives is is a good narrative a good a good sense of our life as a story and um I just feel really lucky that I've been able to combine those two elements in my life in terms of writing and courses and adventure and um you know being a caregiver for others and a and envisioning a, a good outcome for your life and so i congratulate you on your your concept you your i show yeah it's good any last words black cat no <laughs> just want some treats okay got it. <laughs> um, so thank you again for coming on the show and everybody be sure to check out Gail's links down in the description so that you can follow her and learn more. Thanks, Randy. Bye. Bye. <laughs> As always, thank you so much for the amazing guests that we have on the show. Um, be sure to check out their links down in the description below. If you want to support the channel, go ahead and check out our merch store. We've got some very cool things on there. That's my favorite. Sorry, I'm busy ending the stigma. Um, but there's some other very cool designs. 10% of the proceeds always goes back to the Canadian Mental Health Association. Be sure to follow us on Facebook at RV Media because we have some great new shows coming up and you never want to miss any of those episodes. And remember, the only way to end the stigma of mental health is to speak openly and honestly. Bye!